Thank you, Toby. We're back on this again, aren't we? There are different kinds of sermons that you preach, and this one is one that's about teaching what the Scripture is saying, because we're not even to the heart of what we're preaching the next few weeks, which is those fruit of the Spirit, that long list of things that came at the end. But until we can understand what happens before, we'll never understand what we're talking about. So this is another one of those going back and digging into the Scripture sort of sermons. So either I'd nudge your neighbor if they fall asleep or take a nap with your eyes open. There was a woman who got home from church one day. Her husband never went with her. He didn't like church. So she got home, and she'd been a little ticked off with him anyway. And said to, So he said to her, what did the preacher preach about this morning? She said, sin. He said, well, was, she, was he for it or against it? We're talking about being in favor of things and against others. And one of the things that Christians are accused of often is we, we're really good at saying what we're against rather than what we're for. Would you agree with that? Are we better at saying what we believe in or what we believe against? What do you think? A little bit of both, right? But here we are again with this list of do's and don'ts, sort of. Doesn't seem that way? Because the works of the flesh are what? You saw it a few minutes ago. What, what were some of the things on that list? The works of the flesh include what? Immorality, immorality sexual immorality. And we all go, whoo, that's not me, right? Right? That's not me. Sexual immorality. What else? Impurity. That's not me. Debauchery. Not me. Idolatry. No. Sorcery. We can get into all that stuff. And then it gets down to these things like strife, jealousy, uh-oh, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like these. And Paul says those words that just sting, don't they? I'm warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Which is why I picked the lesson to go with this from the gospel. You know the story of the rich young man, right? He comes to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question if you're doing everything that you think is right, isn't it? Because he's expecting what? He's expecting Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And Jesus says, why are you asking me about what's good? You know who good is. God alone is good. And then he says, if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. The guy's like, ooh, check those off. Which ones? Jesus says, don't commit murder, adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony on your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, oh, yay, I've done all those things. What am I still lacking? And then Jesus says the words that just stab him in the heart. If you want to be complete, go and sell all your possessions, all your possessions. Go give away everything you've ever earned or inherited and give the money to the poor and follow me. And he hears this and he goes away sad grieving because he had a lot of property. We could put up with that, right? Because we're not rich, right? You Raise your hand if you're rich. Hate to break it to you, we're the richest people on earth. Did you eat this morning? Not because you didn't have time to eat, but did you have food in your home to eat? Did you sleep inside last night? Do you have clean clothes? Do you have warm water to bathe? And we're among the richest people on earth. Uh-oh, what did Jesus say about the wealthy people? Uh-oh. It is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You know that story that they tell you about? There is a gate in Jerusalem called the camel's eye and, or the needle's eye, and you have to unload your camel to get through it. That's not true. It is now, but it wasn't the time Jesus was alive. What he was saying was a big old camel, one hump or two, I'm not sure, but a big camel. Have you ever been close to a camel? Anybody here ever had a camel ride? They're big things, aren't they? I rented a baby camel once. You can rent baby camels for a live nativity. And it was a baby, and it could eat off the top of my head without bending over. Just, you know, right there. Not reaching up, just eating off the top of my head. It was a big animal. Jesus said it's easier for that to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we all go, uh-oh, uh-oh. At least I'm not that rich, right? No, we're rich. And the disciples, who were poor by comparison to most people of their day, said then, who can be saved, Lord? And what does he say? Same thing the angel said to his mother when she said, how can this be? For people, it's not possible. With God, all things are possible. Which means it's what Paul is saying in the letter to the Galatian church. It's about the grace of God. It's not about what you've done right. It's not about what you've done wrong. It's about the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Remember how we started last week? We said those terrible words, circumcision and castration. 
because that was the argument. People were coming to Christ, and the Jewish Christians said, well, if we had to do this, you must have to do this too, because you can only be saved through the law. You have to observe the law. The law says be circumcised. Paul gets so mad and says, you're going to circumcise yourselves. Just go all the way, guys. Not, not an easy word to hear, is it? But he's saying, if you are about observing the law, you're going to fail, right? You're not going to make it on the law alone. Nobody is that good. Nobody is that perfect. Nobody is that pure. But you've got to go on grace. Because if you put yourself under the law, you've got to really fulfill the law, and the law will not do it for you. So let's go back to that list of things, those works of the flesh that are obvious. Sexual immorality. Everybody says, that's those people over there, right? There are some translations of scripture that are paraphrases of scripture that literally say homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom. Not a word that was used in the time of Jesus. Sexual immorality means anything outside marriage, anything at all outside marriage, you're not inheriting the kingdom. Now, I can't tell you how many times parents come to me and say, how do you talk to your kids about premarital sex when you've had premarital sex yourself? I said, ah, yeah. The world has changed since 1950 or 40 or whatever. And I said again last week what I've said so many times about the people who came up to me at someone's 50th anniversary party and said, you know, they had to get married, don't you? Had to get married. So, oh, they're out, right? According to this law. If we go by the law, they're out. But impurity, that's the way we think. That's really what it's talking about, the, the word here. The thoughts that you have. Everybody always have pure thoughts about everybody else. Do you just look at everybody and say, I just love him, love him, love him? No, you don't say that, do you, about the people you live with, much less the people you don't like in the world. Debauchery. What's debauchery mean? Anybody know that one? Another name for it is hedonism. It's all about me. Everything I want, the rest of you are on your own. No one has ever had a thought like that here, right? Now, I'll tell you what happened this week, and some of you saw it on Facebook. Our lease is here, my hero. There was no chocolate in the office, none. I was losing my mind. I don't have Kara. I have to have chocolate if I can't have Kara, because it's all about me, right? And I put something on Facebook to that end, and Arlie said, there's stuff in Kara's desk. She left it for the volunteers, and I thought, I can't eat it. I'm not a volunteer. Well, that day, I happened to be the only person in the office. I didn't have any secretarial help that day. And I said, dang. It's called rationalization. That's, that's another word we don't have on the list. But that's what we're doing, isn't it, when we say, oh, all these people do this, but not me. Idolatry. Idolatry is not just having a statue in your house that you kneel before three times a day. What is idolatry? Anything that gets between us and Jesus, anything that gets between us and living a full life of caring for others as ourselves. And we all have our idols, don't we? Some people it's a car or cars or multiple cars. For other people it's what? What are some things that people idolatize in their lives, idolize in their lives? Money, security, what else? Power, amen to that, boy. Lots of people want power in the world today. Sorcery, we think, well, finally, we've gotten to one I don't have to worry about because I'm not into witchcraft. Read your horoscope any time in your life? Is there anyone here who has never even peeked at their horoscope or looked at anything like that? Some of you are like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. Envy, factions, dissensions, quarrels. Nobody here has ever had a disagreement with anybody else, right? Only if you've lived in a cave by yourself your entire life, and that even I get mad at myself some days and fight with myself over things. Carousing, drunkenness. Now, perhaps we're not all addicted to alcohol or drugs, but... We've all had our moments, haven't we, of being a little loose-lipped with some things we've said and done. So, Paul says, I'm warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, then we all might as well pack it up and go home right now, right? No. It's about the grace. That's what he's trying to say. It's about the grace. It's not, and please don't go home and say, my pastor said I can go out and get drunken and carouse and read my horoscope and do all these things. It's not about the law. It's not about the law. It's about the grace. But it's being in Christ that lets you say no to those things, right? Because to quote Paul, 
in another place where he says, well, if it's all about the grace and, and sin has no power over us, then we should sin all the more, right? So that God's grace can abound. And then he says, by no means. By no means is it about a life that is just whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. But it's about saying that those are the things that keep us from God, the natural part of our life, because everybody has done something on this list. I'm sorry, everyone here has done something on this list. Some of us have done more than one. Some of us have really gone for the gold and tried to do them all. But those are not the things that are pleasing to God. The things that come out of a life in the spirit, it's not about saying, if I do these things, I will go to heaven. It's about saying, if the Holy Spirit lives in me, if I invite the Holy Spirit into every decision I make, if I ask God to lead me and guide me, if I put myself in God's hands above any other hands, including my own, if I truly put myself in the power of the Holy Spirit, that stuff is going to fade away. And what's going to take its place, the fruit of the Spirit is going to start showing itself in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control meaning that there's chocolate in the office and I don't have to eat it. Self-control. I don't have to say everything that comes into my mind. Now, I used to have a permanent seat in Roger Marks' office. Anyone who went to Cockeysville Junior High probably remembers Roger Marks. He was the vice principal. I had a permanent seat in his office because... If I had something funny to say, I said it out loud. I always knew I was in trouble when I got there. My mother was called over because she worked in the cafeteria. And if she came over, especially on a day with spaghetti and her apron was covered with red sauce, I thought, I'm in trouble now. And they would both say the same thing to me every single time. Terry, you do not have to say out loud every thought that comes into your head. And I'd say, well, I kind of do. And they'd say, no, you don't have to say everything out loud that comes into your head. Self-control was my hardest subject in junior high. But those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It means that everything we do is going to be about outward living, not about ourselves anymore, which is what it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself, to put everyone else's good as equal to your own. Now, maybe you recognize the title of the sermon today. Are you a spiritual fruit or a religious nut? There are religious nuts in the world, aren't there? How would you all define a religious nut? Somebody who just has all the answers, right? And they're always aimed at someone else, against someone else. Um, you all know that there's a lot of factions going on in the United Methodist Church and in the government right now, right? We have people who are so gung-ho that they're right and everyone else is wrong that there's all sorts of division going on. There is a man in Congress who's leaving Congress, Adam Kinzinger. He's a Republican. Now, I said that to somebody the other day. They said, he is not a Republican. Yeah, he's a Republican. He's leaving office because of the threats he's had from serving on the January 6th committee. Now, one of the threats he got was, I'm going to get your wife, I'm going to get your kids. We know where your family is, and we're going to get you. Another person said to him that... Um, He's going to be executed, and that his wife and son will be joining him in hell, too. But the one that really gets me, and he's gotten dozens of these calls, is the one that said, I pray that the wrath of the Lord God Almighty will come upon you, your health, your family, your home, your livelihood, and I'll pray if it's God's will that you suffer. In the name of Jesus Christ, that's what someone is saying to someone else because of a political disagreement. That's a religious nut. We have chased a generation of people out of the church because we judge them when they walk in and they don't look like us or act like us or dress like us. The young woman who came to one of my congregations broke my heart. She came with her baby. She came wearing the same pair of blue jeans and the same t-shirt every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday with her little baby. They were all clean, but they didn't dress very well. But she opened that hymnal. She didn't even have to open the hymnal. She sang every hymn in the book. She sang every hymn, knew every hymn in the hymnal, knew every hymn in the faith we sing. I could tell she'd been raised in the church. But she didn't dress well enough for some people. And so two women decided they were going to fix that. They didn't like her baby. He made too much noise and ran around. So what they did was they walked up and they stood with their backs to her, making sure she could hear and said, if some people don't know how to dress for church, maybe they should just stay home. 
She stayed home from that day on. I went to see her. She lived in the projects outside Martinsburg, West Virginia. Her house was immaculate. I didn't know her life story until that day, and she told me, she said, she had been raised in the church. I said, you know every hymn in the book. She said, yeah, I was raised in the church. I was in the youth fellowship. I was in the CCYM. I did all that. She said, my grandmother is the president of the United Methodist Women for the Virginia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, the largest conference in United Methodism from the largest church in the Virginia Conference. She went to college, fell in love, ended up pregnant. The guy married her but he had a lot of problems. He was dealing drugs. He was in trouble with the law a lot, in and out of jail. She wore what she had to church. That was the only outfit she had, was a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. I said, please come back, and she said, no. She said, I feel bad enough about my life. I don't need to go to church to feel worse about my own life than I already do. It's a story I've heard again and again. because we use the words of Paul against other people instead of looking at our own lives and doing our own personal inventory. We can't be like that. We live in a very diverse neighborhood. We should have a very diverse congregation. Amen? I went to Cockeysville Junior High when it was Cockeysville Junior High, when it was a brand new school. I went to Delaney High School. There were six black students in Delaney when I was there, and maybe four Asian students. Teresa was there at the same time. You remember that those days? The neighborhood has changed, but we've got to change with the neighborhood. We have to invite everyone we meet into the congregation, whether they look like us or not, whether they act like us or not, whether they sin like us or not, because we are all sinners in need of grace. Paul said that very clearly a couple of times in his other writings. We have to remember that it's grace that saved us, not our own actions, not our own righteousness. It is grace alone that saves us, which is why we sang what we did this morning. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, not their sin, not my sin, not your sin, our sin, because we all need the grace of God in Jesus Christ, or we're all left outside. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could just get to heaven and unload our camel there, go through that gate, say, I'm in. It's not about that, is it? It's about saying that everyone in God's eyes is beloved. Everyone has another chance. I don't get to send people to hell. If I did, I'd really be sending people to hell right and left. That's why I don't get to do that. Because there are people that make me angry a lot. I can't say Adolf Hitler's not with Jesus Christ. I can't say anybody's not with Jesus Christ because it is not my call. It is my call to share the love of God so freely and richly that other people are attracted to understand that they can be loved too. Because there are so many people that do not know that they can be forgiven, much less loved, because they've never known forgiveness or love in their lives. But you know it. You know it. You sang it this morning powerfully. You're going to sing it again as we prepare to close the service this morning. But we need to ask ourselves, does my life show the fruit of the Spirit or am I just going to be another religious nut? Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you are. Right? We've all, we've all done that. I've said words unintentionally that have driven people from their faith. But we are always called to examine ourselves and to say it is about grace and grace alone. Who can be saved? They asked Jesus in their desperation. Jesus said, people can't do a thing, but with God all things are possible. So in the name of that loving God, invite someone who is broken and hurting to be part of this fellowship. Invite someone who struggles against addiction Invite someone who has just made a mess of his or her life. Invite everyone you know to the grace that you have found in Jesus Christ. Because so what is grace? God's love given freely, requiring nothing in return. But if you put yourself under that grace, you'll start to see things change in your lives. So it's not going to be about carousing anymore. It's going to be about forbearance. It's not going to be about drunkenness and debauchery. It's going to be about self-control. It's going to be about 
patience and love and joy and peace. So where are we going to be? Are we going to open ourselves to God's will? Or are we going to just continue in the way we've gone? It's all up to us, isn't it? Because God has opened the door and called us to come through. So in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, take someone's hand and lead them through to the place that you have found peace and joy and love and patience and forbearance, gentleness and self-control. Then we'll have lives that really do produce fruit. For the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.